my love, was, has dedicated her career to public health and community activism. She got her master's in public health from the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Now she is director of public policy and advocacy for RISE, an organization that works with people coming out of incarceration. Harris's resume includes accolades, such as the Greater Omaha Chamber of Change Maker Award, Top Outstanding Young Omahan, and honors from the NAACP and the ACLU. Uh, Scout Richards, is that correct? Richters. Yeah. Richters mm -hmm. is the policy director with the ACLU Nebraska. From Defending Nebraska's Right <coughs> to Make Their Own Reproductive Health Care Decisions to collaboratively working with smart justice reforms to address Nebraska's broken criminal, legal, and prison systems. Scout's work is focused on bringing about policy changes to improve the lives of all Nebraskans. Scout regularly conducts an in-depth research, drafts comprehensive reports, develops and gives presentations, has continuing education courses for other attorneys, to empower members of the public to know their rights and advocates for the Nebraska legislature. Scout graduated from the University of Nebraska Lincoln with a Bachelor of Journalism degree and earned her Juris Doctorate from Brooklyn Law School. During her time at Brooklyn Law, Scout clerked at the National ACLU's Women's Rights Project. Let's give our presenters a hand. Is this mic? Can you hear me with this mic? Yeah. <laughs> I have two of them on me. I'm not sure why. Oh, that Maybe I just. That, is that just for the stream? I think that one just goes into the stream. So you'll need both. Yeah. Hello? Better? Okay. okay. Then I'll let you have. And I have it's free. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to be here. It's really an honor to be on a panel with these two. These are great friends awesome. and strong advocates for the uh, reform that we'll talk about today. Uh, I've been introduced. I'd like to give you a little bit of my background and kind of how I rolled in. That I'm a practicing lawyer and that I do personal injury work. And so you might wonder how did this guy ever get into criminal justice reform. I served on the Judiciary Committee when I was first elected in 2007. Uh, Brad Ashford was the chair for my first eight years, and I was the vice chair of that committee. So I was around the Department of Correction issues a lot in my first eight years. Um, I like to say that we would have the Director of Corrections come in to the Judiciary Committee and they would tell us everything's fine. <laughs> it's getting a little overcrowded in there. No, everything's fine. We got it under control. And uh, in 2014, it all kind of came to a head. And uh, as it turns out, I had put a resolution in to study the Department of Corrections. And we began that process. And you'll remember back in 2014, uh, we ran into the miscalculation of sentences. And then we realized the Department of Corrections was letting people out who hadn't completed their, uh, the term of their sentence. And so, we began to realize that we had a problem with overcrowding, a very serious problem with overcrowding. And that special investigative committee ultimately worked through the summer, and it culminated in literally having the governor under oath and testifying in front of uh, that special investigative committee about the overcrowding uh, situation at the Department of Corrections. And so that was my sort of entry into uh, this topic of corrections reform and overcrowding at the Department of Corrections. And then I got term limited. So I was out for four years. We put out a report in 2014. And in 2015, certain reforms were made by the legislature. Uh, my colleagues were, many of them who served on that special investigative committee were not term limited. Senator Chambers, Keith Mello, uh, a number of those 
folks did some reforms in 2015, but it was clear the problem wasn't getting solved. So I returned four years after being term limited, uh, became the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and dove in and made corrections reform uh, sort of our number one subject uh, at the, at the, uh, in the Judiciary Committee and certainly my own personal priority for four years. That process, uh, and I'll give you sort of an overview of what we did, uh, that process uh, ultimately led to a couple of unsuccessful bills that I introduced my first two years. I would put these bills on the floor. I would collaborate, I would learn everything there was to know uh, about the subject matter and come to the floor like I used to be able to do in the old days and try to get a bill passed. I wasn't having any luck. And it was at that point that I realized that we needed to bring in a conservative group and collaborate on this topic. It's not enough for me as someone who might be a little bit left of center uh, to introduce bills and try to get them through a, what is becoming a very conservative legislature uh, on the topic of uh, corrections reform. So we, we brought in CJI, Criminal Justice Institute, Institute. Uh, and that was by agreement of the Chief Justice, myself, and the governor. And so it looked like we were developing a collaborative process there. And that group actually set up a panel, and that panel met uh, mostly at the governor's mansion. It included public defenders, it included judges and prosecutors and law enforcement, the governor, the chief justice, and myself. And um, Senator McKinney was on that group, as was Senator Geist. And that group came up with a number of recommendations that turned into LB 920. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that, that bill sort of the ideas that came out of that. But, I, but what I know or what I appreciate about this topic is when I talk about it, a lot of times people feel like they're coming in the middle of a conversation. So I'd like to back up a little bit, sort of give you a, an overview of criminal justice uh, reform and the Department of Corrections and sort of the criminal process so that you have an understanding, at least when you leave, leave here and you pick up the paper and you read something about the reform, you're going to understand, hopefully, uh, with this overview, a little bit better what they're talking about down in Lincoln when these proposals come up. Now, I, that, that group, uh, the CJI work group, spent a lot of time on these topics, and there is a lot of nuance and a lot of detail that I can't do today, but I'm going to try to give you sort of the 30,000 foot view of corrections and the criminal justice system so that you can then understand why we have an overcrowding problem. And I'll talk about what that looks like. And um, when we got to the place where we're overcrowded, and I'll go through those numbers with you, not try to bury in statistics, but to, to talk a little bit about Nebraska's overcrowding problem, we're not the first state to address that. Like other states have, other states have done that, and it really was a consequence of a generation of politicians saying, elect me, I'm going to be tough on crime. And that was a great way to get elected. And then when they got to their legislatures across the country and in Congress, they made good on that promise, and they stiffened a lot of penalties. And so the answer, instead of more rehabilitation or more addressing the core issues of the problem like poverty, we made sentences longer. And as a consequence, and this is pretty easy to understand, our prison got more and more and more full. And, it, and the overcrowding became more and more acute, not just in Nebraska, but across the country. Other states have faced the same problem, and they have chosen to do criminal justice reform. And that's really what we're talking about today. After I give you the overview, we'll talk about criminal justice reform. But these groups that come in, as CJI did, and give us all the statistics on Nebraska so that you can see where the problems are, they call that smart on crime instead of tough on crime. Really, who do we need to be incarcerating? It is the people we are afraid of, not the and the, the people that can be reformed, we should be reforming. And the, 
Some people, if you're, if you're committing the worst of the worst kind of crimes, you should be incarcerated. That's just... Other states have looked at this and said, let's be smart on crime. Let's try to figure out how we do more rehabilitation, keep people in the Department of Corrections for less time, and alleviate the overcrowding at the same time. And I saw this issue as we began the process as not just a fiscal issue. Are we going to build another prison or not? Like that's $500 million we're going to spend on more prison space. Are we going to spend more money on capacity, or are we going to spend more money on rehabilitation, trying to get people to solve some of the core issues of the problems that lead people to criminal behavior. And that's sort of the idea about being smart on crime. Um, so I, ha I did a handout uh, that you all have, or hopefully I brought enough copies for everybody, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And, and many of the places that start already know this, the Department of Corrections. The Department of Corrections has nine facilities. Um, we have a women's facility out in York. We have a place for the juveniles who are literally being incarcerated, not a detention center, but these are young people who are committing serious felonies, and they're incarcerated in the youth facility in, uh, down by the Air Force. We have two community corrections centers. Those are like work release centers, uh, one in Lincoln and one in Omaha. And then we have three centers that are basically four, I guess, that are basically for incarcerating adult men at one level of custody or another. So maximum, minimum, and sort of community uh, down in Omaha is like a lower level of, of custody. There's a little more freedom, a little more That's out in McCook. At one time, that actually was a work ethic camp <laughs> where they teach people to weld and trays and things like that. We abandoned that a long time ago in favor of more capacity. As we outgrew the space we had. We just said <laughs> the work ethic camp is now a dorm style place for a lower level of custody where we can store adult men who are getting closer to the end of their sentence. You probably know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. The Department of Corrections is, is run by the Director of Corrections. And the Director of Corrections is appointed by the governor. So this Department of Corrections belongs in the executive branch, even though the legislature spent a lot of time um, trying to legislate improvements and reforms. You make policy, the governor runs the place. So that's a little bit about the Department of Corrections. The people who are sentenced to the Department of Corrections are sentenced there because they've been convicted of a felony. So in the law, a felony is anything that carries a sentence of a year or more. If you get convicted of something that's a smaller misdemeanor, that's something that carries less than a year. So the people headed to the Department of Corrections have been convicted of a felony, and that's by definition something that carries uh, more than a year or a year time. There are different kinds of sentences, and you can tell I'm giving you background so that the rest of what I'm going to say makes a little more sense and you kind of understand the, the jargon, if you will. There's, of course, the death penalty. That's a sentence that, that can be imposed. There are flat sentences. So generally, in something like a, a class four felony, you may be sentenced to one year somewhere. Sentence. We have mandatory minimums. So a mandatory minimum is where certain offenses, mostly gun and sex offenses, you're going to be sentenced to a period of time with a mandatory minimum, which means you get no good time. You are going to serve, if you get a five-year mandatory minimum, you're going to do five years no matter what. There's no way out. You're not going to get paroled during that five years, and you're not going to get good time credit. Uh, during that five years. Uh, and then we have indeterminate sentences. And this is kind of an important concept to understand. 
the indeterminate sentence is a sentence that has a high number and a low number. So you hear, you read in the paper, somebody got, uh, let's say, 8 to 12. That's an indeterminate sentence. It means that person's going to do 8 years before they're parole eligible or 12 years before they have their mandatory release date. If they lose all their good time, they're getting out in 12 years no matter what. At eight years, they're allowed to parole out. And I'm going to talk about good time because it cuts those numbers in half. One more concept, and that's the concept of consecutive versus concurrent sentences. So if I walk into a liquor store and I got a little meth in my pocket and I pull a gun out on somebody, and let's say I have a prior felony conviction, I'm going to, when they stop me, get charged with possession of a controlled substance, use of a gun in the commission of a felony, robbery, and felon in possession of a firearm. So I can do in a single transaction four crimes, right? You, when you get charged with those four crimes and convicted, there's two ways to do the sentence. One is to have them go end to end. So First one, for robbery, you're going to do 5 to 10. Use of a gun, 5 to 10. Felon in possession of a gun, 5 to 10. Uh, and so that's called a consecutive sentence. Defense lawyers call that boxcar in the sentence because you're putting them one, one after the other. Or the, court, or the court can run them concurrently where they say you're going to do all of those, all four sentences at the same time. Now you can see, you can see, you don't have to look at this as long as I have to see. That makes a big difference in how long somebody spends in the Department of Corrections. So that's kind of important. I want to go back to that uh, indeterminate sentence because this is, this is an important concept uh, in terms of understanding the problem um, at the Department of Corrections. So if I get a, I want to use my example. Let's say I get a six to eight year sentence. With good time, those numbers get cut in half, okay? So when I walk into the Department of Corrections, uh, they're going to calculate my sentence. Immediately, whatever the judge has given me, this doesn't include life and mandatory minimums, whatever the judge has given me, they're gonna cut in half. That's the good time statute. As long as I don't get trouble while I'm at the Department of Corrections, as long as I can hang on to my good time, then my sentence will go from six to eight to three to four. Okay? It took me a while as a, as a civil trial lawyer to understand how all that works. But it's important because that low number, so I used a six to eight year sentence as an example. That turns into a three to four. So my parole eligibility date is now three years into my sentence. If I don't get parole, then I gotta serve out the four, assuming I don't lose any good time. Okay? Now you can see why I'm giving an overview because this this gets a little complex in terms of the sentencing structure, but a really, really important con uh, really important concept. I have to behave to maintain that uh, good time. If I don't, the Department of Corrections will take it away, adjust my sentence, and I'm gonna stay there longer. That's the incentive an inmate has to not get a sort of major violations while you're in the Department of Corrections. <laughs> that sentence range that I talked about, the three to four, that four is important because at Three, I am parole eligible. At four, that's my mandatory release date. We call that jamming out, or it's generally referred to as jamming out. I'm gonna jam out, my jam out number's four years. My parole eligibility number is three. I wanna talk about the parole board. Because in our constitution, we have a separation of powers. So once a judge sentences someone to six to eight years, 
that judge can't go back and review that sentence. The only person that can make that sentence lower than it was when they announced it is somebody in the executive branch. That's either the board or the parole board. The pardon board isn't letting anybody out early, okay? That's, that's just not happening. So the parole board, though, it's important to understand what those folks do. We have parole board members, there are five of them, they are appointed by the governor, and here is an opportunity to find the guys who figured it out before their jam out date, right? This is gonna be the people who, who get it. They've been incarcerated for a period of time, and now they can go in front of the parole board and try to get out sooner, right? Why is that important? To be parole eligible, to even be eligible, you gotta complete your clinical programming. So if I'm a sex offender and I've been convicted and I walk in the front door uh, at the Diagnostic and Evaluation Center, now called something else, the RTC, they will do an evaluation of me when I go in. They'll calculate my sentence and then they'll do an assessment and say, Lathrop needs to have, before, he's, before he leaves here or before he is eligible for parole, here are the things he needs for clinical programming. He needs inpatient substance abuse, he needs inpatient sex offender treatment, and he needs um, moral reckoning or whatever. It's a sort of a cognitive behavioral program that they have. Those are called clinical programs that run by like RISE who do but it's not. So, so I've been given my sheet and it calcul calculates my sentence and it tells me what I gotta do to be parole eligible or to be, to be successful in my efforts to get paroled. I gotta complete these courses. There's a lot of things that I can do besides those courses like participate in RISE uh, and Jasmine will have an opportunity to talk about the program. But, I have to complete those. If I go in front of the parole board and I haven't done that, they're gonna say, nope, you haven't completed your, you haven't completed that. Now the parole board, people appointed by the governor, they need to see that you get it and you're not a, you're not a significant risk to society. Sometimes when they have these parole hearings, victims will come in and say, you can't do this, and the parole board will say, yeah, I agree. This is not, this guy isn't a suitable candidate. Uh, I don't think he gets it. Uh, he hasn't completed his programming. So parole is something you have to earn and you have to work at, and you have to complete your clinical programming. But if we want people rehabilitated, we want to incentivize them to do that, right? We don't want people going in and saying, I ain't doing your programming, I'm gonna jam out, right? Because then they leave and they haven't received any of that, any of that programming. So going back to my three to four year sentence, if a person is paroled at three years, that person will be followed by a parole officer until his jam out date. So in my example, that person is now going to be followed for a year. That means they're accountable to somebody. A little better deal than somebody that jams out, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. They're accountable, and another thing that happens when they're paroled is that they get services. So if I jam out, I am walking out the door with a gate check or something, a hundred bucks after you've spent like 10 years at the Department of Corrections. You're supposed to figure it out. It doesn't happen. But if I leave on parole, I'll have a parole officer. There may be things I need to do. I may need an outpatient substance abuse program they help facilitate setting that up. They may help, they help me find a job. The things that most people need coming out of the Department of Corrections, the parole officer is going to be there and that parole process facilitates that. And not surprisingly, we have way better outcomes. So the recidivism rate for people who parole or who are followed after they leave the department is lower than people who jam up. 
And that's not really that hard to figure out. So if you got to take away today, parole's a good thing. Parole's a good thing. We want people to parole because we don't want them to come straight out of the Department of Corrections not be accountable, not have any rehabilitation, and move in next door to you, right? Uh, so that's sort of, a, that's sort of a, an overview, and maybe the background you need for, or, or the understanding I can provide as we go into the problem at, in Nebraska at the Department of Corrections. And that brings me to some of these slides that I have, or I guess I didn't do slides, because I'm not really <laughs> that good on that whole, PowerPoint thing. <laughs> <laughs> but in here you'll see um, on page four, this is the population by facility. So the Department of Corrections maintains data on the average daily population of the Department of Corrections in each facility. And I have here, um, because of where I pulled it from, and this is what I was working with last year when I was trying to pass my uh, LB 920. This is the population by facility. You can see like the women's and the youth facilities are below 100% or close to 100%. They're not the problem. Like, we're not overcrowded with women uh, and we're not overcrowded with the youth. It's mostly the adult men. And you can see that uh, in uh, pardon me, 2022 we were at 150% of design capacity. So why is that important? Uh, well, first of all, when the place is at 150% of capacity, some of these are like near 200. Um, RTC is at 200. You're bumping into each other. You're double bunking in, in cells that weren't met for two people. Uh, it's also a strain on the staff. It's a strain on the ability of the Department of Corrections to get you to the programming, those clinical things and pro-social activities that help provide some rehabilitation. So overcrowding is bad for a lot of reasons, not just, you know, I'm sharing a bunk with somebody or sharing a cell with somebody that's meant for one person. Uh, it's a problem in terms of how you run the place. And the state of Nebraska went into a overcrowding emergency in January of 2020. One, I used to know all this stuff right off the top of my head. July 2020. 2020. 2020. So <laughs> since January, July 1 of 2020, we've been in an overcrowding emergency. And an overcrowding emergency is defined in the statute as when our average daily population exceeds 140% of design capacity. And we remain in that status until the average daily population drops below 125% of design capacity, okay? So we've been in, literally for three years, we've been in a overcrowding emergency. And the issue, and why we're talking about this, is are we going to try to do smart on justice or are we gonna to try to build our way out of this? And that's kind of, that's kind of the issue that we debated uh, I think not just my last year in 2022, but last year as well as they made the decision to move forward with building a new facility down in Lincoln. So if you turn to page five, this is like my favorite chart. I made this myself. <laughs> <laughs> when I was trying to persuade my colleagues that we had a problem, I would go around one at a time and then I would share it on social media. I would share it with anybody who would stop me and talk to me or listen to me about uh, the Department of Corrections and our overcrowding problem. And this chart illustrates it. So as you look at the black line, the top one, that's the average daily population. 2020 JFA, JFA is a an outfit that Nebraska contracted with to come in and project our population. Mm -hmm. And this is a science. We've had it done four or five times in the last 20 years, and it's remarkably accurate. So that dotted line is a projection of our average daily population if we don't change anything. 
We don't, we don't change any sentences. We don't change any sentence structure. That's going to be our average daily population. You can see by 2030, it will be 7,327 inmates. The red line is operational capacity. That's 125%. So until the black line intersects with the red line, we will remain in an overcrowding emergency. And you can see each time you see the blue and the red line go up, that's us adding capacity. So you can see since 2018, we've tried to build more capacity. Like, I've been talking about this to the And so they start building space in this. This is what will with this facility they just uh, committed to uh, down in Lincoln. We addressed and as a policy maker, as a, someone who was there to help make good policy, that I'm tough on crime, and the people want me to be tough on crime. I don't think are going to just say, do whatever you want, because this is getting expensive. It's getting really, really expensive. And there's a human toll. There's a human toll when the social ill and the things that are going on is to incarcerate people. And then you decide that you're going to incarcerate them longer, you're going to give them longer consecutive sentences, and then you keep people longer than they need to be. So now you get a sense of what the problem is. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, a little bit about some of the solutions. Okay. One of, the, one of the things that you can see from the presentation so far is that sentence structure, that indeterminate sentence um, matters, right? How close those numbers get to one another, right? The parole eligibility number and the jam out number, how close they get to one another directly influences the decision of a, an incarcerated individual on whether they're going to participate in that list of clinical programming. So what we found, what we found is that not only were politicians saying, I'm going to get tough on judges. So when somebody came in and did something really bad, okay, robbed somebody at a gunpoint, something that the victims involved, the, it was, you know, newspaper kind of stuff. Well. I'm going to give, well, give somebody 30 to 30. That's what they're going to do. Hey, I ain't doing your clinical programming. I'm going to jam out. And it doesn't have to be a 30 to 30. It can be a 28 to 30. So when those numbers, is made by the incarcerated individual not to go through the programming. Do that because it's easier to do a little more time than to be accountable to somebody once they get out. They got ideas about what they want to do when they get out. If you're not going to give me a, a, an incentive to go through the programming, an incentive to try to get parole, then I'm not going to do this stuff. I'm not going to do this business. I'm just going to jam out. And so when we look at this through the season, in my estimation, problem facing the state in terms of overcrowding is sentence structure, and, and in particular, the solution that we put in LB is 
say, whatever the top number is, the low number needs to be half of that. So if you're going to get somebody 40, it's got to be 20 to 40. If you're going to give them 30, it's got to be 15 to 30, right? So why is that important? Because even with good, you give them. Now we're at 10. Now that person has a huge incentive to participate. By the way, even if you participate in that program and your parole eligibility date comes in, you still have to convince five of the governor's appointees, three out of five, that you're a suitable candidate. And that parole board's going to consider the fact that you did the programming. That's minimum requirements, right? What else have you done? Have you gotten in trouble? Have you gotten, have you been getting in fights in the yard? Those kind of things. Say, you know what? The guy's done 10 years. He is a model. He is a model. He's and I mean, participating in um, non clinical programming voluntarily and participating in pro social activities. So he may be meetings, he may be doing the programs that rise uh, the things that the parole board looks at. And by the things, you're not a good uh, candidate, the parole board says no, and then you come back next year, right? So you really have to is going to be accountable. So was to into how it was taken out. It was kind of a sneaky thing. They got their chambers by sneaking it in the bill. But restoring that gap between the low number and the high number increases the opportunity or the incentive to participate and try to get parole. It increases the likelihood that people will participate in rehabilitation. And if they're paroled, we'll have better outcomes. We're going to see people who aren't as likely to come back as the people who are jamming out. I have, in the, in the um, handout, I have a mandatory discharge report. That's at page 8, 9, and 10. So. This is kind of like where the rubber meets the road. Who are these people that are getting these kind of sentences, and which people are not paroling and jamming out? Like this ought to be scary. If you look at this mandatory discharge, and this comes from the parole board and the Department of Corrections, so this isn't a Steve Lathrop thing. Um, on page nine, at the top on the table one, you'll see where it says release back. Mandatory discharge. In 2022, 362 inmates were mandatorily discharged. In other words, they jammed out instead of paroled. That, uh, we had 1,092 that were either on parole or on post release supervision, which is for the lower level federal felonies. So that 362, if you go down to the next table, 85% of those people were convicted of a class 1, 2, or 2A felony. 85%. And if you go to the next page, you'll see of the people who are being, who are jamming out versus parole, this is what they've been convicted of. 20% of them on a weapons charge, 11 on burglary, 11% of them on sex offenses, Theft, drugs, 18%. So you can see the people that are being mandatorily discharged or jammed out. We'd rather see them parole out or at least have an opportunity. So that idea of opening up the range so that people have incentive and that we have more people paroled and have better outcomes uh, was an important part of the LB9. The other 
provision that we put into LPN 20 dealt with consecutive sentences. So I talked about that a little bit ago. I talked about that a little bit ago. The consecutive sentence is where you put them one after the other. So if I'm involved in a single event, like holding up a liquor store or robbing somebody or I get a fight, whatever, whatever those things are where they can charge you with four or five felonies all at once, LB 920 basically provided that if someone has been convicted of multiple offenses in a single transaction, there should be a presumption that the that sentences will be concurrent and not consecutive. Just created a presumption. It didn't require that that be the case, but the court needed to make some special findings before they said, I'm going to run these sentences back to back to back because now what we see are these long sentences for, say, middle, middle of the road kind of things that are all connected with one, one stupid thing, one criminal activity. So uh, working on the consecutive sentences was one of the features of LB 920. Another one was drugs. And so this, this is kind of, a, this is, a, an important feature of LB 920. It was residual amounts, so small amounts of drugs. And so let's say that I'm driving uh, through town and law enforcement pulls me over. And uh, they have me get out of my car and they look around they see a pipe in there. And inside the pipe is residual from somebody smoking a controlled substance. Uh, they can take that. Um, test the residual and charge me with a felony possession of a controlled substance, okay? Now, you may say, well, of course, the guy had more than a residual amount when he was using it. Maybe that's true. This is an epidemic, right? Drug addiction is an epidemic and we're treating it like a criminal matter. And there's a lot of science and a lot of studies about what's the best way to do this. But when it's a residual amount and you hang a felony on somebody, understand the consequence, because this is kind of important and it's a little more below the surface. But if I get, if that's me and I get a felony and I'm 18 years old or 19, I'm gonna have trouble getting a job forever. I gotta tell somebody that I was convicted of a felony. It affects my ability to get housing. It might affect my educational opportunities. I can't get in the military. The other thing it does is if I ever have a gun on me, I'm now a felon in possession of a firearm. And this one seems, even when I talk to some law enforcement guys, they're like, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. That makes perfect sense to me. But there was a lot of pushback from prosecutors. And, and frankly, I think it's because they want to have more people with felony convictions so that they're felons in possession of a firearm, particularly when we now have permitless carry. Like, I can go to Cabela's today and pick up a gun and start carrying it. Well, if we get a lot of people with felonies, and by the way, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna direct you at the end of this, or maybe I'll direct you now. There is a, on the front page of my handout, there's a website on there, and that website um, is where, uh, when we were doing LB 920, I put a whole bunch of information, like our CJI stuff, and I also put some World Herald articles in there. The World Herald article, Jim Reportis did some really, really great reporting on criminal justice reform when this was all going on, and copies of those articles are in there. I really would invite you, if you are interested in this topic, to read this article because you will be shocked at the percentage of adult men in two zip codes in this city who are incarcerated. And it is the highest incarceration rate of anywhere in the country, in two zip codes in North Omaha. And that, that's sort of addressing, that's sort of the moral issue, right? But when we, when we hang a felony conviction on these people, and then we find them with a gun, or they're in a car with somebody that has a gun, and they're in a constructive possession, and now they're a felon in possession of a firearm, and now they're going down. That's, that's why this is so important. That was important and uh, it didn't get anywhere. Uh, 
but it, but it is, you know, we're talking about it, we're trying to get it there. Uh, but that was a, an important feature of LB. That bill had what we refer to <laughs> as consensus items, things that even the governor agreed to. And frankly, that kind of stuff I agreed with, but it was gift cards, pilot programs. It wasn't consequential stuff. It wasn't consequential stuff in terms of getting to the root of the problem and what we recognized was a problem. And then we had what they called the non-consensual items, the things that not everybody in the group agreed to. And those things were what stopped LB920. Last year, Senator Wayne introduced LB50. LB50 was basically LB920 all over again. They did agree ultimately on what I would call some nominal changes. They're not gonna move the needle that much. The things they agreed to, we looked at a year ago, and the effect on the population was not that great. But if you look on, uh, um, let me direct you to the page so that, okay, now I've shuffled all my papers, so. Just a couple more. If you go to page 11, you can see this is, this is the projections, and CJI did this. This isn't Steve Laser. Yes, sir. Um, the group that we brought in uh, that does criminal justice reform across the country made these projections. If LB 920 passed, <laughs> it would essentially flatline our, our prison growth. Now, LB 920 didn't pass, and neither did LB 50 in its, in its form. So we still have these problems, right? The things that I've just talked about are not incorporated into uh, what became LB50 uh, that passed the legislature. But uh, if you look at 12 and 13, you'll see that from a fiscal point of view, just from a fiscal point of view, what this is costing the state of Nebraska and what will save if we would have made these reforms instead of building this new prison down there, instead of trying to solve this problem by building our way out of it. Because as soon as you build the prison, you're gonna spend 10% of the cost of that place on staff and everybody in it each year. And um, we did what we could. We held it up in 2022. This year, uh, it passed the legislature and uh, we, are, we are on our way to building more capacity and they're gonna make room for more building uh, on that campus than they're actually building right now and we will be in a spot. And from, from my perspective, from my perspective, as I've worked on this issue, it struck me that it is not just a policy, it's not just a fiscal issue, but it's a moral issue. It's a moral issue when it comes to what are we gonna do with human beings who are addicted to drugs, who have made a bad decision. Are we going to throw them away? Are we going to incarcerate them? Or are we going to try to do things like problem solving for them? for non-conviction probation opportunities, where people are given the opportunity and the services for substance abuse or one type of rehabilitation or another uh, without having to be uh, first incarcerated, where we're spending $40,000 per person a day. And so the math gets pretty easy to do, uh, and you can see what the savings look like. Uh, that is sort of an overview of the problem uh, and an overview of what I think are probably the three biggest solutions uh, to the issue that would get our prison population uh, to stop growing. Uh, these kind of reforms have worked in other states. They've worked in other states. And oftentimes they refer to this as justice reinvestment. Instead of spending that $40,000 a year per inmate on the Department of Corrections, we take some of those resources that we would spend on people being incarcerated and put them into substance abuse programs, mental health programs. I can tell you mental health, I could talk for days on mental health. That's, most of those people are a, a significant percentage uh, have been diagnosed with a major mental illness. And a lot of times that's what got them in there. Uh, that's not I'm depressed because I'm now incarcerated. That's 
schizophrenic and uh, getting convicted of things for, for doing dumb things uh, out in public. Uh, so that's my overview. I hope that when you now see this come up in the paper, when you now see these issues uh, show up in the news, uh, that you'll have a better understanding of what's involved, why these types of reforms are important, and uh, I look forward to answering questions in a little bit. I think I next get to introduce Scott Richter. Yeah. So I, I will tell you this, that when I was down in Lincoln, uh, we all think, we all hear about lobbyists, right? And there's lobbyists for, there's lobbyists for the beer wholesalers, and there's lobbyists for the schools, and there's lobbyists for all these people, the Chamber of Commerce, and all these money people. Scott has been with the ACLU for a long time. And the ACLU is actually, and the work they do down there, is really important for with Scout and with Daniel Conrad, who was a colleague of mine for eight years, and has since returned. And they're a really, really important voice uh, in the legislature for uh, the social justice issues we care about. Over to Scout. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think that overview was very helpful. I learned things. So um, I am going to focus on one particular topic, and that is um, solitary confinement that, that we see used and overused in both the Department of Corrections um, as well as the juvenile justice system. Um, a little bit about the ACLU. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that works to defend and protect um, the rights of all Nebraskans as guaranteed in both the United States Constitution as well as the Nebraska State Constitution. And we um, intentionally prioritize the rights of historically unrepresented or underrepresented groups. So that includes um, indigenous Nebraskans, immigrants, uh, LGBTQ plus Nebraskans, women, um, and then another one of those groups is uh, formerly or currently incarcerated Nebraskans. Um, we have several tools in the ACLU toolbox. We um, participate in public education events. We um, engage in policy advocacy. And then, of course, we um, have litigation um, that we try to use as a last resort. Um, so I guess I'll talk a little bit about why solitary confinement is um, a priority. Or reforms of solitary confinement are a priority issue for the ACLU of Nebraska. Um, first of all, they can, um, the use of solitary confinement can violate um, the Eighth Amendment's uh, prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment, the Fourteenth Amendment's right to due process, um, we know the impacts, which I'll talk about in a little bit, of, of the use of solitary confinement are devastating, um, long-lasting, and, and really harm the broader community at large. Um, we also know that the impacts of solitary confinement disproportionately harm uh, people of color, as do all the policies within the, the prison system and, and uh, the criminal legal system do. Um, so I'm going to talk about the harms of solitary confinement, um, solitary confinement in the juvenile justice context, and then solitary confinement within um, the, the prison system that Senator Lathrop was talking about. Um, so first, when we're talking about solitary confinement, I think it's important to um, talk about the many different terms that are used um, that actually equate to solitary confinement. So there's solitary confinement, but it's also known as room confinement in the juvenile context or um, um, the whole segregation, isolation, um, or in the adult context, restrictive housing. So all of those um, are different terms, but, but kind of boil down to the same thing. Um, the length of time people are housed in solitary confinement varies across systems and across institutions. Um, but at the high end, Nebraskans um, currently are being held in solitary confinement for days, weeks, months, even years at a time. Um, so just a little bit more about the harms of solitary confinement. The medical consensus is very clear. Um, solitary confinement amounts to torture. 
Um, we know that it exacerbates existing mental health issues, creates new mental health issues um, for those exposed uh, to solitary confinement. We, we see increased suicide rates. Um, and then just when you're in solitary confinement, you're also denied rehabilitation, education, other, other types of programming. And then we also have um, the effect on the communities um, and, and the lower levels of safety in the community. Um, just as an example, we have the Inspector General's report from September, I believe, um, and that shows, um, as Senator Lathrop was talking about the jam outs, we have people who are gonna jam out from um, direct, not only just, just not be on parole, but they're gonna jam out from years or months and years of solitary confinement directly back into the community. Um, so kind of going, uh, kind of separating out and going into uh, solitary confinement in the juvenile uh, justice context. So this is not the prison system, but more um, juvenile detention or um, the youth rehabilitation and treatment centers um, for youth. Um, so we have, I guess I would say relatively recent um, <laughs> Supreme Court jurisprudence um, from 2010, 2000, 2005, and 2010. So I guess not super recent, but um, courts have really increasingly begun to recognize that youth should not just be treated as mini adults. Um, they recognize brain science that tells us that um, brain development is not, is not finished until someone reaches their mid-20s. Um, and also we have the goals of the juvenile justice system, which are, of course, rehabilitation rather than punishment. Um, so in line with this, courts are increasingly considering um, really the constitutional propriety of placing youth in confinement and more and more thought leaders and policy makers <clears throat> and members of the general public are really seeing the dangers of, con of solitary confinement specifically for um, juveniles and young people. Um, and there's, we have a clear consensus among mental health professionals that we should not be using isolation of young people except in the absolute, when it's absolutely necessary and even then only for extremely uh, short periods of time. Um, so the ACLU started work in the juvenile solitary confinement context around 2016, and at that time, there was really no tracking or reporting of, um, for facilities um, using juvenile solitary confinement. Um, so we sent what's called open records requests to get a picture of really what was happening around that time. Um, at that point, we found that several facilities had um, a five-day limit, one facility had a 90-day limit, one had about a 15-day limit, and that is specifically solitary confinement of, of young people when um, we know that best practices say it should never be in excess of four hours for young people. There were also, um, from that open records request, we found that there were no standards of what could really land a young person in confinement. Um, we got a list of the different reasons that uh, youth were placed in confinement, and I remember one was, oh, this, this uh, young person had too many books in their room. So that's a reason that could land someone into confinement. Um, uh, and I think there's an average length of stay in one facility for solitary confinement of around 187 hours, so you can do the math of the days that that would involve. Um, since then, um, we really had seen incremental progress um, in this area. So in 2016, that led to a um, bill that, that requires, uh, required facilities to submit reports about their use of solitary, which, um, again, incremental progress led to what has actually been described as one of the most comprehensive bans on juvenile solitary confinement in the entire country with LB 230. Um, that was introduced by Senator Pansing Brooks um, and is now law. Um, some of the highlights of that bill, uh, confine, any confinement lasting longer than an hour needs to be approved by um, an administrator at the facility. Um, a, the big one, I think, is that solitary confinement cannot be used to punish a youth, so no longer could someone be placed in confinement for having too many books in their room. Um, it can only be used after all less restrictive um, um, means have been tried, um, and then also requires the mi minimum standards for, for rooms that are used for confinement. 
Um, what um, I think is important to note that what really led to the support of that bill in 2019 was um, reports about the condition of the YRTC Geneva. Um, I'm sure many have, have read about that. Um, it's now closed. Um, but things like exposed wires in rooms, mold, um, no education, no programming, lack of staffing, and again, also included long-term use of solitary confinement. Um, we have a ongoing lawsuit uh, concerning that now closed facility um, and the conditions that, that our clients were exposed to. Um, and so that is currently in the discovery phase, but there is um, a pending lawsuit on, on that. Switching gears to um, solitary confinement in the prison system for, for adults, um, we have a ban of solitary confinement on vulnerable populations with um, LB 686 in, in 2019, which included, again, a ban um, on confinement for vulnerable populations. Um, when they define vulnerable populations, this includes um, prisoners who were pregnant, uh, young adults, and, and in the adult prison system. And then the big one was those with serious mental illnesses. Again, um, as Senator, talked, Senator Lathrop talked about, there are a significant number of um, Nebraskans who are incarcerated with very definitely would be in the category of serious mental illnesses, um, including, again, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Um, but what we have seen, that is that bill is now law, it passed, but what we've seen are concerns that the Department of Corrections is finding ways around the ban um, on solitary for some vulnerable populations, particularly for those with, with uh, serious mental illnesses. So for example, um, one concern is creating um, separate units or mental health units that, while, while again not called solitary confinement or restrictive housing, effectively are that and, and it's just um, the same practice in a different name. Um, and we also have seen concerns about uh, potentially not providing people with the proper diagnosis so that they um, are not, not uh, restricted from being placed into, into confinement. So um, even despite um, this progress, um, we, via our um, intake mail system, we hear from dozens of Nebraskans each month um, that are held in solitary confinement, again, for weeks, months, even years at a time. Um, uh, I think I already mentioned this, but we know that the most recent Inspector General's report um, released in September does show that some numbers and the duration of solitary confinement um, has, has gone down a bit, but, but we know that this progress is simply not enough, um, just given, again, the devastating impact that um, solitary confinement can have. Um, so uh, kind of switching gears, I, I, there's a handout that I think is on your tables. Um, and that includes mention of some pending legislation, LB 557, uh, introduced by Senator Vargas this last year that will carry over um, into the coming session, um, which would implement what's called the Mandela Rule. Um, that would limit use of solitary confinement to 15 days. Um, and we all, there's also postcards on your table, so I would encourage everyone to use those. We have extra um, and take those and, and write to your senator about um, pending the LB 557 that is um, currently pending right now. Also included in the info um, is a, a QR code. I can never really figure out how to use them, but I'm sure people can help. <laughs> um, but it is about um, becoming a, what, what we call a smart justice advocate. So as Senator uh, Lathrop talked about, smart policies that are smart on crime rather than tough on crime. Um, but that will provide updates on different hearings going on, activities, um, to engage in that includes uh, solitary confinement reform, but also reforms such as the things that um, Senator Lathrop was talking about. Um, policies that will really help address that overcrowding crisis, um, things like um, just things like the, the policies that Senator Lathrop was talking about. 
So um, I think that we'll do it for the portion about solitary confinement, but looking forward to our panel discussion and, and um, talking about this more. I'll turn it over to Jasmine Hannon. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm glad I had coffee. <laughs> I can keep up with the conversation and hopefully engage you all more. I will tell you all to stand up and get some movement in. If you want to, I won't be offended. Um, so I'm going to kind of bring in everything that Senator Lathrop talked about. He will forever be Senator Lathrop to me. <laughs> and what Scout um, talked about in the sense of what RISE does and being one of the um, only people up here with the organization that actually is a service provider and, and go into the prisons and work with people as they're coming home. So what I like to do when I talk with folks is get a gauge in the room. How many of you would like to be known for the worst thing you've ever done for the rest of your life? <laughs> and that's what our people face. They're arrested, they're on the news, their pictures are everywhere, they go through their trial, they're incarcerated, and then when they come home, they have a scarlet letter on their chest. We call them invisible handcuffs because forever what they made that decision to do will follow them for the rest of their life. And so we work with individuals um, to try to get around that and, and how do we reform the justice system to ensure that people have an avenue and a pathway to success once they come home. Because as Senator Lathrop talked about, people are coming home. They're going to be in the community, they're going to be our neighbors, they're going to be our coworkers. 90% of people who are incarcerated will come home. So how do we ensure that that is a successful path forward when we're talking about reentry? And um, we're talking about solitary confinement, people um, coming straight out of being confined. And we know that that is um, detrimental to people's mental health. Going into incarceration is detrimental to people's mental health. But then you have these overcrowding crises where I think Senator Lathrop was kind of um, generous in his amount of people who are in rooms together. <laughs> because sometimes it's about three or four people in a cell together based off where we are with the um, overcrowding um, issues that we have right now. So we're looking at how do we reform this system? And what I also like to tell people, the system is a juggernaut, right? When you look at like a big machine that has all the cogs and wheels and everything working together, it was designed to work the way that it works. So don't ever think it's broken. It was designed to work exactly the way that it's working. So when we look at all of the different pieces, Senator Lathrop talked about the prison piece, and solitary confinement is within that prison piece. What I also like to draw the attention to is that community is a part of that criminal justice system, and this is where we come into uh, being able to reform. So for me, and what we always talk about at RISE, reentry is crisis. If you've been incarcerated for 10 years, what are you walking into? Because we know five years ago, Omaha doesn't look the same way that it did five years ago. Technology was not the same five years ago. So if you've been removed from that, trying to navigate how to get, how to <laughs> do what they say, become a productive member of society, if you don't have supports and help in place, it's very scary navigating trying to come home. How do I know? I've had family members who are incarcerated, immediate family members who are incarcerated. And, and I'll back up, and, and how did I get involved in this? Because I was a person who grew up in North Omaha. I still live in North Omaha, so I see this consistently daily, in and out. And I had my own touch points with the criminal justice system as I was a young adult in that 18 to 24 year old population whose brain wasn't well developed, making stupid decisions, and had my own touch points with the criminal justice system. Now I say, I, I, was, I never experienced incarceration at um, NCCW, which is the women's prison, so I was never in a prison, but I've been arrested, I've been in jail, I've been on probation, so I know how these systems work and I had to navigate them myself. Well, Jasmine, you, you, you made it, you were successful. How'd you pull yourself up by your bootstraps? <laughs> I didn't have no bootstraps. 
I had to sit here and really take inventory of my life and say, you were on a better path than what you were on, so now that you know exactly how you're impacted, what are you going to do to help others? Because for me, it was a point where my misdemeanor convictions kept me out of work for almost two years. I couldn't get jobs that I had previously, couldn't get jobs I was overqualified for. I went to college. I was on a track to be a doctor, pre-med. And then I figured, okay, because I'm out of work, what am I going to do? I have to go back to school to get a work-study position to make ends meet. Fell in love with public health and really understood then how policy comes into play when we're talking about how do we change our community? How do we reform this system? It has to be a collective effort. And I tell people all the time, RISE is an organization who offers programs in facilities here in, in the state of Nebraska. We um, go into, how many of it is it now? Five of the nine, because I was like, wait a minute, it used to be 10. They combined two to make RTC. Um, <laughs> so we're in five of the facilities. We're uh, um, working with people who are at the Community Correction Center. We offer a six-month program that focuses on character development, employment readiness, and entrepreneurship. And we say entrepreneurship is the, is the carrot that we dangle, because most people want to start a job or a business. And like, I got this business idea. So they come into the program not knowing the best thing that they're going to get from this is the character development piece. And how do I know that? Because at the beginning, we take a pulse. People are there for the, employ or for the entrepreneurship piece. At the end of it, they say the best thing that they ever got out of that program was the character development, doing a lot of the introspection work. So as with that program, as people navigate through that, um, we have uh, now our reentry team. So we have community navigators who start working with people about 18 months before their release date. So they're working on their reentry plan. Where are you going to go? Who's going to pick you up from that gate if you only have $100 in your pocket? What community are you going? Are you going back home? Who do you stay away from? Do you have a job planned and lined up? So it's working through all this because, again, if I'm incarcerated for 10 years, I'm still thinking, Joe over here got all my stuff he said he was going to have. I ain't talked to Joe for about 10 years. You know, it, it's, it's those mindsets and things that people are thinking everything is going to be okay when they come back home. So if you don't get anything else out of this, reentry is crisis and supports are necessary. So as we talked about LB 920 uh, from last year and then into LB 50 this year, that's why that piece about um, expanding parole was so important. Now whether you are parole eligible and you, and you have that access to get on parole or you have a mandatory release or you jam out, support is important. Everybody who mandatory releases is, is not going to walk down the path of not being accountable. There are some people who will. But what we're trying to say is being on that parole, being, in an or being with an organization like RISE, there is the ability to get the support you need when you're coming back into crisis. Why is it crisis? Because a lot of times people's basic needs are not met. Now, when I went back to school, I got my master's in public health. And this was before there was a College of Public Health on the UNMC campus. It was still just a joint program between UNO and UNMC. So I like to say I was one of the original folks. We talked about this thing called social determinants of health. Does anyone know what that is by show of hands? All right, social determinants of health is what is going on in the basic areas of your life that dictate what your health outcomes are going to be. What I tell people is it's the social determinants of life because where I live is going to dictate how I live. So if I don't have housing, where am I living? On these streets. I think um, if you're watching news, we've seen this news story about all the homeless encampments that are popping up. People don't have places to go. We are in a housing shortage, affordability crisis across the nation. And Omaha is just like now starting to see, oh, these homeless encampments are popping up everywhere. They've been all over the place. You ignored Skid Row over in LA over there, but now you're seeing it in the face and, and you have to deal with it. If I don't have food, 
what am I going to do to survive? I result back to what I know, and that's survival of the fittest. I have to, I have to make it. So that's what I focus on a lot when it comes to community and reentry, and how does this all come together? And I worked with, I, get, I got to work with Senator Lathrop on LB 920. Who, I tell you, I'm one of those lobbyists. I'm so scary down there. I said, <laughs> <laughs> totally not. I get to work with Scout um, and do all the things too. But it's really for me centering the voices of those who are impacted. As Senator Lathrop talked about when the CJI process started, it was Senator Lathrop, then Governor Ricketts, Speaker Hilders, who had to come together to say, okay, we want to bring in the Crime and Justice Institute to review all the data and everything. And so they created this task force. And the thing that I notice about this task force is that there was nobody who was impacted by this justice system on that task force. And I said, hold up. How are we going to in influence what's going on if you don't even know how it is impacting folks? Mm -hmm. You may think you know, but until you walk in somebody's shoes or hear exactly what's going on with it, you will never know. And so I reached out to Senator Lathrop and Senator McKinney and was like, hey, can we get some people's voices in the room? And so that was one of the things they charged CJI with, was to ensure they included the voices of the impacted. So setting that up, ensuring that people, service providers, people we worked with, that they were in there looking at everything that was presented, all the data, and coming up with solutions and sending those recommendations up to this task force. And so being that this is a labor of love and seeing that it, it did not pass last year. And I was like, okay, what are we gonna do? And seeing that Senator Wayne was gonna pick it up this year, we fought so hard to try to keep as much as we could. Um, and as Senator Lathrop can attest to it, people are gonna do what they wanna do and take the information that they wanna take and find out if it's a reelection season and all that good stuff, whatever their higher aspirations are, and then try to dwindle away the work that you put into this, knowing how impactful it's going to be. So what LB50 ended up having in it, which was compromised from LB920 was, we'll create a sentencing reform task force. Okay, at least we're gonna address that we need to look at sentencing reform in the state. What they didn't have on there at first was some criminal defense lawyers, it was just prosecutors and senators, and I was like, can we get people from the other's perspective on this? So that made it into there. Um, it, they took out the residual um, amount, and then we had to compromise on the amount of time that people could get a look back on being parole eligible and the habitual criminal law um, that's in there. It passed. However you want to say it passed, whether it was by the skin of its teeth or whatnot, it became law. So now what we're faced with is our now Attorney General, Speaker uh, Hilders, who was the speaker who signed on in the beginning, is contesting that law. So what does this have to do with us? Now that you know more, you can become more involved and bring your voices. Because we work so hard to get people who have been impacted in the rooms, it shouldn't be on their shoulders to have to continue to live trauma and relive trauma, explaining their stories and why it's important that we fight for what we fight when it comes to um, how they are impacted when they come home. Some of the other um, policies that we're working on that is uh, community and reentry forward facing um, are things like LB20, which is voting rights restoration. Well, why does voting rights matter? Why do we need to have people have their voting rights back after they're convicted of a felony? Because you told them to come home and be productive citizens of the community. How am I supposed to come home and I don't feel like I belong? You want me to belong but you take away all my rights where I don't feel like I belong, so why do I care? I just go back to doing what I'm doing because I haven't, I'm, I'm blacklisted, I'm ostracized, I'm othered. And what we found in research is that people who get involved civically, engage in their communities, their recidivism rates reduce. I'm a part of something. People accept me. I belong. I tell people, look at how we talk about youth and gangs and why do youth get involved with gangs? because they feel like they belong and they're going to protect what they belong to. So if we make it to where people feel like they can come home and feel like they are a part of the community, they're more apt to build it up. 
the more apt to get involved. And the story I like to talk about with this is we have people, so if you don't know the law in Nebraska, there's a two year waiting period from when you finish your felony conviction sentence. That could be you serve five years in prison, come out, still have five years of parole. So you're living that five years in the community on parole. You still have an extra two years after you finish that five years before you can vote. So you're living in the community for seven years without your right to vote. We have had people who have bought homes, sold homes, started businesses who cannot participate in the basic right of saying, how can my government dictate my life? You can be on the left, you can be on the right, I don't care. I want you to have your right. So that's why we fight for that. Um, other things that we are digging into um, this year was LB88, and that is the SNAP benefits ban. So in, I think it was 96, the federal government made it to where all the states could opt in or out of um, banning people from re, uh, receiving food stamps, the SNAP benefits, based on felony drug convictions. Nebraska is one of the states who still has that permanent ban for certain drug convictions. So if you were um, convicted of distribution or manufacturing of a controlled substance, you have a lifetime ban that you cannot ever receive SNAP benefits in the state of Nebraska. So that sentence, I, can't, I don't remember how many years a sentence like that holds, but you're coming home. So if I'm coming home and one, I'm struggling because I don't, I don't have a job, I might need some food when I get home, I can't get that benefit. So that not only impacts the individual, that impacts families. Because if I'm coming home back to my family and I am trying to reintegrate, if I'm in a family where SNAP benefits are provided, I don't get included in that number. So the amount that comes to the family is cut, but I'm still gonna eat, right? So what does that do that then therefore impacts children, the food that's in the household, things like that. So we're, we're trying to work with senators to remove that lifetime ban because it, it makes no sense, right? We want all Nebraskans to be able to eat. And it doesn't just impact, and, and that's another thing. People just think the crime is an urban issue. It's not. It's statewide. We have a lot of people in our rural communities who are impacted by this. And, and the solution that people say, well, why don't they just go to food pantries? Have you been to a food pantry in rural Nebraska? Are they open all the time? Do they have enough staffing? What does that look like? Some of the other things um, that we focused on are um, things like Medicaid access. Mental health and substance use are, they're up there, they're top line when people are being incarcerated. I remember in 2007 when I started, dang, I'm dating myself, so. <laughs> Never mind, I'm talking to a room full of people who are like, what do you mean, youngster? <laughs> um, <laughs> so in 2007, I started my master's of public health program in one of my classes, I remember it was a, a news story that we watched, and it was talking about the closing of Richard Young and the closing of like all of the mental health facilities. So this was like me, baby, getting involved. And I'm like, why are we closing all the mental health facilities? The number one mental health providers in the state of Nebraska now are your Douglas County Jail and your Nebraska Department of Corrections because we have criminalized mental health and substance use. As uh, Senator Lathrop talked about, it's an epidemic. And I would be remiss if I don't talk about the racial disparities when it comes to people who are incarcerated, people who are being pulled over. And I'll speak specifically about African Americans. We make up about maybe four to five percent of the state population. If you look on page six of Senator Lathrop's um, handout, we make up almost 29% of the incarcerated population. Why is that? So when we're talking about access to Medicaid, things like that, and I, I was missed, so that was kind of like a side note, but access to Medicaid. So when people were being incarcerated and having mental health conditions, being given their medications in facilities, once they were released, it was at one point in time they were only being released with, I think, and I think we had to fight for like two weeks worth of medication. So again, reentry is crisis. I don't know where I'm living. I don't know where I'm going to get my next meal. 
why am I going to be worried about these meds that I have to get filled here in about another two weeks? I don't even have a health care provider. So now what we have, um, people are released with a 30-day um, supply of medication. And then this past year, it was um, passed where people will start working with their, um, in, within NDCS and the Department of Health and Human Services to be enrolled in Medicaid before they are released if they, are, if they qualify. So that's a, a step forward to where people, that's one thing off their list they don't have to worry about. It's all about decreasing the barriers. So now that I don't have to worry about getting access to how I'm going to pay for my medication, I'm being released with 30, so I at least have 30 days before I need to go find a provider to continue to fill um, my medications. Workforce, workforce, workforce. This is why I got involved with it. Because we're telling people, mark this box that lets me know that you are othered and I can throw your application in the trash can. But you need to be a productive member of society. So how do we do that? In 2015, I think it was then Governor Heineman signed a law that all state, county, local governments need to remove the box off of their um, hiring process that says, do you have a criminal background? I'm still fighting for private sectors to have to get rid of it because, let's be honest, most people who are coming home from incarceration are not applying to work in our state, county, or city governments. They're working in the private sectors, and they're up against so much. And one thing at RISE that we do, we have um, a director of employment services, and so what she's out there doing is working with employers, trying to break down those barriers. It may be one employer at a time, it may be a, a five employers next, but we're starting to really dig into how can we ensure people have jobs when they come home. So in the legislature, um, right now there are two bills that are sitting, I'm forgetting what fair chance hiring one is, but there's fair chance hiring, which would remove those boxes off of applications in the uh, private sector, and then fair chance licensing. Because there are people who are incarcerated who do programs, get certificates, things like that, and they can't do that same job when they come home because there's a, a, a board that's over certifications that say, well, you got this on your record, I don't know. So what we're trying to work to do is to find out what those restrictions are and to streamline how people can apply to have that license or certification to do the job that they were trained to do that they learned while they were inside. Or I have this dream when I come home that I want to go to school and get a license here to do this. And I'll give a story of an individual who did all this, had over 20 something certificates when they were incarcerated and came home and couldn't do that. Couldn't be a yoga instructor. You know, things as, as that, like that. So. We're fighting to uh, get that removed right now as well in the legislature. And something else popped into my mind, but it left again. Um, I'm right on time. Are we almost there? Okay. <laughs> I'm talking a lot. I feel like it. Okay. And then um, I think what we're also working on, doo -doo -doo -doo. Senator Lather Benton mentioned one of the other things um, with the overcrowding uh, population is the technical violations with parole. Mm -hmm. So this is people who have achieved their parole eligibility, they've been released, they come home, they're on parole, but then there are these things that we don't even know about. It's not someone committing a whole new crime, but it's something that you may not even, it, it may not even be an arrestable offense at times, but it's a violation of your parole that your parole officer put as part of your orders and then you're sent back into a locked facility. So part of that LB 920, um, which did make it into LB 50, was that the um, parole was set to create like this halfway back house, if you will. So instead of sending someone all the way back to a locked facility, if they um, qualified, they would be able to go to um, now this house that parole is operating that has a little more structure, but people are still able to remain in the community 
to get their um, treatment, to keep their job that they found, if they found one, things like that. So helping people along the way. But what was concerning about this, the recidivism rate in Nebraska is a little over 30%. So that means one out of three people are gonna go back within three years. That's a problem. And 40% of those individuals were going back on these technical violations that could have been like, you drove over to Council Bluffs and you weren't supposed to drive over to Council Bluffs. It could have just been, I was going to go eat at a restaurant or something, but if they found out about it, it's a violation, things like that. So it's, it's not an arrestable offense, but it's something that is there that you can't um, do. And we can send you back for that. So I think those, some of those things made it into LB50. So those are like things that we were trying to um, work on as well. And then pretrial, whoo, cash bail. And we had bills introduced. I, I want to show hands. Is Nebraska ready for cash bail? The, the, the removal of cash bail? I'm trying to fight to ensure that this is brought to light as well. Um, we're working on a project. It's called the Justice Study. And we're partnering with um, Harvard Law School's Access to Justice Lab and um, the University of Zurich, looking at the long-term impacts of being bailed out or not on people's life. And it'll be years before the data comes out because they want to look at a longitudinal. What we have is a lot of anecdotal information. Um, we see it daily in what we do. But it's building up the data that shows how people are impacted by not being able to afford a $500 bail, a $400 bail. We've had amounts as much as just $250 where people are sitting there because they can't afford it. When I look at the title of this forum, who put this on? Poverty. It's a poverty issue. When Senator Lathrop talked about the news article that Henry Cordes did and the two zip codes in North Omaha, high poverty. So what are we going to do to reform the criminal justice system? You gotta start in the community. You can't just have all the programs. It's great, it's great to give people tools that they need to be able to <laughs> pull themselves up by their bootstraps. I got tools. But if the tools are not meant to help me out in the environment that you're sending me back out into, it doesn't matter. When we hear success stories, it's great to hear the success stories, but for that one success story, there's already 10 other people who, who aren't there because they keep running into the barriers. They don't have the support. Having family in life that support you, that's there to help you, it's, it's really important. Having a community there to help, it's really important. So if, if there's nothing else, I think I said that already. So if, two, if there's nothing <laughs> else too that you get out of this, being a community of support goes a long way. Well, how do we get involved, Jasmine? Come to ride. <laughs> I think I see one of our longtime volunteers back there who can tell you more, uh, Paul Fowlman, he can talk about um, volunteering with Rise. But I tell people all the time, rubber hits the road when you're able to, one, get to know somebody who's been incarcerated. If you don't already know someone personally in your life, getting to make connections with someone to see them for who they are and that's just a person, a person who made a mistake, a person who's wanting to change. No, I get it. Everybody isn't there. Everybody incarcerated isn't there. But there are many people who are, who really want to be able to get out, to change, to, to be successful, whatever that looks like for them, because we can't dictate what success looks like for somebody else. But having someone there who is saying hi, who is saying, let me help you find some resources in the community. Let me point you in the direction of um, somebody who I know actually has a house who wants to rent to someone who's not gonna check their criminal background. That's how we build this community. So there are different um, volunteering opportunities that rise. I have information about us up here. And you know our mission is to break generational cycles of incarceration because it is generational. If you look at 
I had both parents in the home. My dad's a doctor. My mom's a lawyer. I think I might be a lawyer. See, sooner or later followed in his dad's footsteps and became a lawyer, right? Some people, all they've ever seen was that their family was in the cycle. And sometimes it starts as young as 11, 8, 7, being involved in the foster care system, which is just another feeder, being involved in, in school and in the school to prison pipeline, which can be another feeder when we have things like truancy laws that want to give parents criminal, criminal backgrounds because the child wasn't, who knows? Those are the things, right? The, like things just get piled on top and piled on top and nobody looks at the collateral consequences of everything that happens from a law we made that it was going to fix this one problem but it created five more problems. So one, volunteering at an organization like RISE, we're not the only one, there are organizations all across the state that work with people who um, are coming home from incarceration, donating time, money, Money always helps. And then also talking to your elected officials and showing up at the ballot box. And the last thing I think I want to touch on, um, Senator Lathrop talked about rehabilitation and the programming and, and how that's impactful or that they need it to even get to parole eligibility. And what I tell people sometimes, it's not even rehabilitation for a lot of people. Rehabilitation means to come back to the status of. Some people have never been at the status. Sometimes these are just the first actual chance somebody has to try and get on a path to move forward in life. So I say it's habilitation and hope. Hope builds up a lot in people. If I know that somebody's out there who cares about me and will help me Hope goes a long way in trying to build out the community. It's not all science-based. There's Senator Lathrop in here with morals. What are we doing to help people? So I thank y'all for listening to me ramble. <laughs> I wrote down while I was listening, because lawyers always want to be rebuttal. And <laughs> not that I have to rebut anything. I, I should have said, I worked with Jasmine, and I thought so much of what they did. I offered to be on their board, and I am a proud board member of RISE. Um, so what Scout and I talk about is like the bad news. This is how terrible it is, and here's where hope is over at RISE. When they go into... My first exposure to RISE was going into the Omaha Correction Center to watch them do one of their entrepreneurial um, events. There were men who had been, there was, I remember one guy who had been, he's serving a life sentence, I'm sure for murder or something, but he's been through the program and he's trying to find some meaning in his life and he's help mentoring these young guys. And the one thing that the one thing that struck me, because I've been in all the institutions multiple times, but the one thing that struck me is when guys like that mentor the young guys, because there's you know take a guy that's 55 and he might been in the Department of Corrections for 20 years and the light's gone off and now he knows he's going to he's going to die there, right? And he's looking for some meaning in his life and he changes 
and in comes some 23-year-old right off the street, and he's like, no, 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 stop doing that stuff. Like the, the mentoring that goes on by some of the older guys for the younger guys, and those kind of programs inside the Department of Corrections is remarkable. And it is what makes me feel like parole is so important because if the light goes on and you're not there for murdering somebody or shooting somebody uh, or a first degree sexual assault, but you're there and the light's gone on because of your experience there, maybe mentoring from one of the other people, somebody needs to look at that guy's sentence. Does he need to be here any longer or does he already get it? Is he gonna be, is he gonna be productive when he gets out? So that's, but, so I'm, I'm making notes and I wrote down Nico Jenkins' name on here and then the first card I got is, if we use Nico Jenkins as an example where and what reform could have prevented his past incarceration crimes and his criminal journey at age seven. I want to answer this one because uh, that's really what started us into the uh, 2014 Special Investigative Committee. It was Nico Jenkins. And uh, you'll remember this guy got out and uh, killed four people. And there was a newspaper article. The first three people he didn't kill, I don't even think it was a newspaper article. The fourth person that got killed was a, a suburbanite at 156th and Fort, and now it's on the front page. And we capture Nico, and, and Marshall Lux, who was the ombudsman at the time, uh, great guy, great public servant, and a friend of mine, Marshall Lux wrote a report. He, it was not one the ombudsman was required to write, but he said, Nico Jenkins is a case study in everything that's wrong at the Department of Corrections. And he was exactly right. Uh, that's what prompted that special investigative committee to uh, undertake what, how'd this guy get out? Because as it turns out, he was, he went on a family trip. I think he went to a funeral for a family member. They let him out for one of these uh, passes and he beat up a guard or he got in a fight with a guard and back he comes to the Department of Corrections and now he's going to spend the next umpteen years in solitary confinement or restrictive, restrictive housing is the term they use. And he's in there going, I want mental health. Get me a counselor, get me over to the regional center. I need mental health. And you know, they're like the people that the psychiatrist is saying he's mentally ill and the psychologists are saying it's a behavioral problem and so we're not taking him over to the regional center. Of course, they wanted to believe the psychologist, not the psychiatrist with a medical degree and he stayed there. And, but for a brief period of time, by the way, read all of his medical records when we did that investigation, looked at everything he promised to do when he got out, which is to kill people and when he, he went from solitary confinement, a brief period in general population, back to solitary confinement, and from there he was released with good time. And out he went and did exactly what he said he was going to do. And when we did that investigation, there was a psychiatrist that treated him at one time at the Douglas County Correction Center, and he came in and said, this guy was like, he had four things going against him, like genetics, family background, um, his history, his, you know, examples in the family. I can't remember all the things, but he was, he was gonna, he was gonna end up this place. And so instead of doing something with him, we put him in restrictive housing where his mental illness got nothing but worse and then released him, jammed him out from restrictive housing to the community where he did exactly what he said he was gonna do. And when I read that in his medical records and he said, I'm going out and I'm gonna kill some people. You people need to know if you don't give me some mental health treatment, that's what I'm gonna do. And it isn't gonna just be people in North Omaha. I'm gonna go out and get some people in suburban Omaha too. And I read that and I was like a chill went down my spine. Nico Jenkins, as Marshall Luck said, is a case study in everything that's wrong. It's restrictive housing, it's jamming people out. It's the mental health and for me, and the work that I've done or the time I spent studying these issues, mental health, number one issue. Like these people that are in there have huge mental health problems. Some of these guys won't come out of their cells. They are so mentally ill. 
some of them need to be forced to take medication because they're so mentally ill. And we, we use punishment and incarceration as an example. What could have been done differently in Nico Jenkins' childhood at age seven? You know, part of his family. Um, I, I'm sure he was in not a bunch of foster care. I don't remember that. But he, he was in not of the juvenile, juvenile system for a long time. Then he became an adult. I think his first, picked up his first felony and went, was incarcerated like at 18 or 17, something like that, and spent most of his adult life incarcerated and most of his incarceration in restrictive housing. So that was a real uh, case study in exactly everything that was wrong. By the way, on the front page, I have a website. The website leads you to these uh, links that are found on the last two pages. On the links are the articles that uh, Henry Cordes did in the World Herald. So if you want to look at this any further, there's a lot of interesting stuff. I put it all on there so I could have people in the public who were watching the debate on 920 know what we were talking about and look at the same kind of documents. Right. I think a lot of my, my take after watching my 920 fail, I'll, it's easy to get elected with fear, right? And so whatever we can do, and if you can go all the way back to um, the, the guy Bush, you know, and the Dukakis, right? Willie Horton. It's, if we can find somebody to be afraid of and then run against that fear and get people afraid, then we can uh, talk about being tough on crime, which is kind of back in vogue now. You're hearing a lot of that. And I understand the importance of criminal justice, right? We need to have rules, and we need to enforce those rules. But campaigning on that is exacerbating a lot of the stereotypes, I think. Maybe Jasmine's a better person to talk about the sort of the what do we do from here. I had a, I had a little thought here, because you said it's just all the different systems, right? It, when you boil it down, it is Do we go to 
school board meeting and talk about how our youth are being failed? Are we getting involved in those places where those rules are being made, where policies are being made? That's, that's why I say you can't program your way out of things. It has to be <coughs> at that level that policies and laws are impacting the system. <coughs> and I'll, I'll end it there because then I'll get on the soapbox. But that's like my simplified answer. Hang on to that mic. Okay. Why don't you hang on to that mic? Because the next one I'll let you take, and that is the two zip codes in Omaha with the highest incarceration rate. What percentage started out as young people younger than 25? I don't know the numbers. And, you know. And I'm, I'll speak anecdotally. You know, I'm quite sure it was what, 68111 and 68110. Were those the uh, two zip codes? I don't even know the two zip codes off the top of my head, but I know they're probably in District 11. Yeah, 68111 and 68110, which is like the heart of North Omaha. I don't know what the numbers are. It took the act of the Nebraska legislature to try and get all the data that was presented here today because data collection is horrendous in, in the state when it comes to you know trying to get this information. So I don't know the exact numbers of what it is, but I will tell you, as you look over the years of those specific zip codes in North Omaha, you have the highest poverty rates, highest rates of child poverty, highest health disparity rates. That's where a lot of um, environmental injustices are happening. It's, it, there's no coincidence to what happens in that area. Um, if you haven't um, visited like the red lining um, muse, um, exhibit over at UNO, red lining dictates a lot of that as well. Highway 75 coming right through North Omaha dictates how all that is. It, it, it was designed to keep people in those boxes and it impacts so much. Hypercriminalization, hyper um, focusing from the police in that area, constant contact, what they call it, improportional um, contact. All of that is by design. So in those area, in those zip codes, that's why you see a lot of that and that's why you'll always see that. And, and I'd be remiss if I don't say this. We talk about the unemployment rate across the great state of Nebraska being 2% or less or something like that. But then when you look in those zip codes, astronomically higher than that 2%. So those are just thoughts. Can I turn it you, will, you will need to hold on to that mic because most of these questions, <laughs> most of these questions, I think you're the right person. Um, this one is what can we do to eliminate waiting period for voting after imprisonment and to qualify for SNAP? Look me up, come get involved. We will be doing a lot of civic outreach. Um, we have been fighting for voting rights restoration um, when I got involved in a lot of the policy stuff back since 2017 when uh, Senator Wayne first introduced it. We thought we had it in the bag. It got all the way to the governor's desk and it was vetoed. And then we couldn't get the same senators to vote to override the veto. Um, and so it, it, it kind of went underground a little bit. Uh, we brung it back at the beginning of this year and Everybody kept saying, this is the year to get it done. We had a press conference, everybody was there. And for voter ID to be the hill that it had to die on because of all the infighting and the filibustering in the um, session this year, we weren't able to get it passed. It's still on general file. It can still be done. We just need people to contact your senators and people to show up and let them know this is something that's important. It's not just a rise thing because you work with people who are impacted by the system, but it's actually a community thing that we want people to feel like they belong, to get involved, to have their voices heard. And it's an election year, so let's see what we can do. <laughs> LB20. I got another question here. This one's about Colorado, and I'm gonna have, uh, I'm gonna use this as an opportunity for uh, scout to talk about Colorado's restricted housing because they're very progressive on that. But the question here is Colorado is one of the friendliest states for felons. Colorado bans employers from performing background checks on positions, jobs with salaries under 70000 Where does Nebraska stand on this? 
and as long as Ron, I'm going to hand the mic to Scout, and she can talk about this issue, but also maybe talk about Colorado, because that, they are really sort of at the forefront of reforms on restricted housing. Yeah, so I believe Colorado does have the Mandela rules in place where it's that 15 day limit to solitary confinement. They've actually recently closed facilities because they've been, as Senator Lathrop said, so engaged um, in reform. Um, and and uh, not just Colorado, but there are a host of, of other states um, across the country who are realizing that this tough on crime mentality does not work, it leaves people and the communities in worse positions. Um, and a growing number of states are realizing that, including Colorado, um, closing facilities. And then here we are doing the opposite, trying to build our way out of, out of this crisis when we see that um, graph from Senator Lathrop where no matter how much we build, we're, we're going to be wasting money and we're never actually going to be able to get to, to where we need to be without other reforms. The next question is, can you discuss the riot history in Tecumseh? Can, can you talk about that? I don't know all of the history. I remember, um, Sheesh Louise, do you, was it 2015, 2014? It was Mother's Day riots. Um, and that's what I remember, because this was before I was really involved in everything. Um, and I think with that, it really set a precedent. When, when one incident happens, everything for everybody changes. Um, but I know there have been different um, things happening throughout facilities, and not, not even always just riots, but um, uh, you know, staff being injured, things like that. But that can all attest to how being in an overcrowded situation um, puts people at danger because you have people, one, you're on modified operations because you can't move people around because you don't have as much staff. Because it wasn't, it's not just an overcrowding issue, it was an understaffing issue as well. There were at one point over 200 positions unfilled um, in the Department of Corrections. I if you don't want to. And I know uh, Senator yeah. Lathrop probably knows a little bit more about um, exactly how many positions were unfilled at the time. But you know, when, when you have to move into modified operations, of which I do believe Tecumseh and maybe NSP are still in that, where um, you are able to move, so people who are incarcerated are able to move around from like Monday through Thursday, but from Thursday, I think 7 p.m. back to Monday morning at 7 a.m., they're restricted into like um, their units and their cells, so it's not a lot of movement. So all that does is, um, get people angry, they're not able to go do their pro-social activities, go to the gym, go work out, you know, things like that, go to their clubs. And so it's just festering anger, agitation, things like that. So it's a boiling pot. Um, and I think that's what ends up happening. So if we don't get the undercrowding under control, you put your staff at risk, um, things like that. So I don't know the full history of it. Paul, was that your question? Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so you asked the question and you answered it. <laughs> we appreciate that. Uh, Paul is very, very, very committed to these issues in a, uh, a frequent, he would frequently appear in my waiting room <laughs> at, or stop me in the hall when I was in Lincoln. By the way, that report about the Nico, we called it the Nico Jenkins study. It's the LR424 report. That's on that list of things that you can access uh, through that website. The next question is, what's your opinion of the Attorney General's effort to deprive the legislature, legislature's prison watchdog of access to information? And why has the governor done this? So uh, I'm going to take that one because the Inspector General of Corrections was my former legislative assistant. Uh, after we did the study in 2014, we had a number of recommendations for improving things over at the Department of Corrections. Um, one of which was to set up an Inspector General. We already had an Inspector General of Child Welfare. That was the result of a debacle during the Heinemann administration when they were going to privatize child welfare, and we wasted millions of dollars, and it lasted a couple of months. And it collapsed. So they did an investigation, set up an inspector general. In 2015, they, uh, the legislature passed a bill to establish the inspector general's office. And so down in Lincoln, we have the ombudsman's office. The ombudsman deals with various complaints people have about state agencies, primarily dealing with incarceration issues and child welfare issues. The ombudsman those individuals that work in that office meet with the people that complain, meet with government officials and try to iron out problems, right? It's great because those people would otherwise be suing somebody to try to get a remedy and instead they go to the ombudsman's office and try to work through the process. So when the inspectors general were established, we put them in the ombudsman's office. So Kobernick is over in uh, is the Inspector General of the Department of Corrections. It's been going on for a long time, since 2015, and someone asked the Attorney General, Mike Hilgers, formerly the Speaker and formerly the guy who was down in the legislature stopping any reform, they asked him, is this Inspector General constitutional? And he wrote an Attorney General's opinion. And so the Attorney General's office is charged with writing opinions when elected officials ask for opinions. So I could ask for uh, an attorney general's opinion. I never needed to because I never felt like the guy over there knew more than I did. Uh, and, and Hilgers just proved it. With this opinion, with this opinion, I felt like it was really, uh, in my, my critique as a lawyer, I thought it was result-oriented and the result he was trying to achieve is to get us to a place where there is no oversight of the executive branch. So what the Inspector General does, unlike the Ombudsman who's dealing with an issue one at a time, the Inspector General in, in both offices, in Child Welfare and Corrections, their role is to investigate sort of bigger problems, systemic problems like restrictive housing, like understaffing, like... Um, Transitional housing. Yeah, yeah, those housing, those kind of things that are sort of policy and then come to generally me as the chair of the Judiciary Committee. They issue a report and say, boy, we got some problems. Or they investigate deaths and serious injuries. Like, somebody ought to be doing that, right? Because the Department of Corrections, trust me, is not going to do a press release and say, today we shot somebody with pepper balls until they had 64 holes in them and we sent the guy to the hospital. Like, they don't do that. You need somebody in there who's looking for those kind of problems and can put the best disinfectant on it, which is light, right? We, we can't fix anything we don't know about. And I, after 12 years at this, I got a lot of concerns about whether 
we as citizens are having an opportunity to provide oversight of the executive branch. And this is really important. The Inspector General, once this opinion was issued, the executive branch shut off access to information, shut off access to the prisons. So now we have an Inspector General charged with telling us what's going on in the prisons, and he can't get in them. He can't get access to the information. And the only solution, the only remedy is for the legislature, these people are housed in the legislative branch of government, is for the legislature to sue the executive branch. Okay? The challenge there is you've got to get permission from the exec board, most of whom are really close to the executive branch, we'll say. I was on that board. I was in the minority a lot. And uh, so I, this is something you should watch closely. How this plays out, you should watch closely because it is important that citizens have somebody who is keeping track of what's going on. And uh, the World Herald, we're watching it turn into sort of a couple of articles that they bought from the AP and maybe there's an article in there or two that's uh, sort of watchdoggy on the legislature, the executive branch, not much. Not like when, when it was up and running and Paul Hamill was down there writing let, uh, articles every day on what's going on in state government. That, if we don't have a robust newspaper and we don't have inspectors general and we don't have ombudsmen, we're not gonna know what's going on in there. And the stuff that happened to Nico Jenkins will happen all through the place. We'll just incarcerate people and you'll never find out that, that what they're doing down there is offensive to you because it'll, the word will never get out. There'll be people writing letters to senators and writing letters to Jasmine or me or Scout or the ACLU. But the other thing is when we don't have the Ombudsman's Office and we don't have the Inspector General doing their work, we're gonna get a pile of lawsuits, right? What's gonna happen is the remedy that's available for these people or the process isn't gonna be there and now they're gonna resort to the one thing they can do and they got plenty of time to do and that's file pro se lawsuits down in Lancaster County about the terms and conditions of their incarceration. And that's a poor substitute for a, uh, a effective watchdog who can report to the public and who can report to the legislative branch. So um, that's something I feel pretty strongly about, as you can tell. What are, oh. Yes, uh, Yes. Yeah, if you didn't hear that, it's the Nebraska Examiner. And a lot of the, so as the Omaha World Herald started to shed reporters, a lot of them went to the Nebraska Examiner. It's free. All you got to do is sign up and they send you a daily email. And uh, Paul Hamill was the guy when I was down in Lincoln who was the reporter, the State House reporter. He's still, he's at the Nebraska Examiner. There's, there's, you, you have to now go look for it, but it's not gonna, they give their content away. I don't know why the World Herald isn't taking all this and putting it in the paper, but uh, you'll see some of their articles show up in the World Herald, but yeah, Nebraska Examiner, right? That's a fair pitch. One more. Pardon? One more. One more question. Okay, oh, okay. Um, Why are inmates not scheduled to receive help rehab, rehab when they are incarcerated and not wait two to three years before leaving for their jam out or their parole? I'll let Scout take that since Jasmine's <laughs> answered a lot of the yeah. questions and I've talked too much. I think it really goes back to staffing shortages, lack of programming. So we have so many people in there that that we're not even able to think about programming for them until they're I'll getting close to, to their either parole date or jam out date. And I think that's one of the big problems. We hear from people all the time who are saying, I want to engage in programming. I want to start my
by programming now. Um, but they're, you know, they're frequently told things like, well, you need to wait until it becomes available for you, or if we're not, you know, you're supposed to do this programming, but then we're not offering it right now. So, I mean, that's not uncommon to hear. And so I think that's just another um, consequence of overcrowding, um, staff shortages, lack of licensed mental health professionals who are able to work with people um, who are incarcerated. Exactly. We are causing the inmates to uh, develop these other problems that they're having. Because I thought that's what jail or uh, prison was for, was for rehabilitation. So mm -hmm. why do we have a justice system if we're not doing justice? Fair question. Fair question. That's the debate we had last year on 920, the debate they had this year on 50. And the challenge is that these guys, the conservatives, uh, see tough on crime as still good politics. And uh, though I'm going to I'm going to throw one more in just because Jasmine's uh, <laughs> here and I'm on the board. How is Rise funded? So, <laughs> Rise is funded through uh, private philanthropy, state dollars, and individual donors like yourself. <laughs> and uh, grants, so um, we have a healthy balance of how we are funded. Again, individual donors like yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now, all these things, like child welfare and compassionate and stuff. Yeah. Um, we have table discussion questions for you to engage in at your table. And we have a seat team member at every table who helps kind of dispose of this process. So at about 11.35, about five minutes time, we're going to bring everybody back together and have each table record <coughs> one or two items for the other discussion. So timing yourself really the most important question is number two. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has a copy of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got a question that I didn't have a chance to ask. The difference between the cannot be and the parole eligible. Okay. Are there guidelines for this or does the judge? Totally. Totally. The restroom. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, recycle. <laughs> Thirty, fifteen difference becomes a, you know, what? Seven and a half to fifteen. I mean, you have it. Yep. That's also up to the judge to do that. What that disparity is is up to the judge. The judge can make the numbers very close together or spread them out. But then there is also, you mentioned a, an indeterminate thing where it can, the dates can be halved. The, the halving is the good time statute. So but if that, you, but that, is that, also, that always happen? Or is, good oh, that, time oh, is always oh, going to happen, oh, oh, okay, except so on death, the possibility. death yeah, life, okay. and oh, okay. mandatory okay, minimum. There's a possibility of having. I mean, it's, it's there. I mean, it, it will happen uh, based on good behavior. I mean, it will happen automatically. Automatically. And you can lose it yeah, you if can you lose misbehave. It. No, of course you can. Oh, okay, it happens automatically. Okay. And so it's basically up to the judge. I mean, this, the difference between GM out and... Uh, 100%. Oh, oh, okay. But you said there used to be guidelines or requirements. So we used to have in place a statute that says the lower number needs to be one-third of the maximum. So okay. if the maximum sentence is 50. Okay, which would create a lower number. Yeah. Exactly. And that, what did that get? Uh, did it disappear? I mean, it got Stenberg slipped it into a bill. Oh, oh to be limited. That just, it was in the repealer. So at the bottom of bills, there'll be a repealer, and it says repeal this section and that section. Usually it's things that you've replaced with the substance, uh -huh. and they just repealed it. When, when was it repealed? 
long long before I was in there. Oh, well, long Stenberg was long Stenberg was the attorney general at the time. Ernie was still in the legislature and hadn't been term limited yet. It might have happened in like the 70s. Or it happened when Ernie, um, Ernie would. would he, so those repealers, we don't look those up. You know, we just assume they're part of, yeah. like, getting rid of stuff that you've replaced in a bill, and they slip that repeal this. It was one statute, yeah, yeah, yeah. one paragraph, and it got repealed in a trick, a legislative trick. When, when Ernie was in the legislature, <laughs> he should have stopped it. Well, I know he. I know he he's sorry he didn't. He stopped an awful lot of bad stuff. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. Yeah. going to be engaging to help to get like um, the constituents of like Senator Wayne and Senator McKinney to be able to know what's going on. Um, so that is on the, I don't know if you saw, but we're hiring a policy fellow. And so that is, I remembered it, took note, that's on their work plan because I thought that's a very good idea because right now it's something that we want to do and should be doing and we just haven't been, you know, so. Well, and I talked to Justin or Terrell. Yeah. Yeah. And I really wish you could have another one. If you can work with them. Some town hall. No, and this policy fellow, policy. exactly. Yeah, and get it so that we're coming there and not saying, oh, come down to the legislature at the most inaccessible possible time. Yeah. Right, right. So and town hall and, and then, and right. And then building on that to, to be able to then like, hey, this hearing is going on, but starting the groundwork first of like the town hall type stuff. The other so. thing, we've got a meeting. So do you have a, is your group called something or no? No. It's just I, you? I okay. Yeah. You go. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty yeah. Much. There's a um, guy that I know, he, he, do, he runs a group called More Movement in Omaha for Racial Equity. Okay. Yeah. And um, I'm showing the movie, do um, you remember the time for burning? Um, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Where they were trying to integrate. Okay. The yeah. The youth group integrated, but then the pastor went to Ernie and talked to him about how to do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, it's not going to work. Yeah. You guys don't want to do this. Yeah. He goes, you'll get fired. So he got fired. Yeah. And they made a documentary about it. It's called The Time for Burning. Yeah. And that was shown all over the country. It was nominated for Academy Award. But nobody knows that after that, Charles Perrault and the CBS people and a producer took the movie and showed it all around the country yeah. and did a one-hour documentary. It's called Time for Time Building. Oh. Nobody knew about it. I just came across it accidentally when I was wow. doing my yeah. research. So we're going to show that oh, okay. um, and talk about the race issues mm. um, at the same church. Uh, oh, Ajamal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's the one that kind of worked with me, told me people I Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. I you know. Uh, but yeah. this is, we're inviting church because it's really the race issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why people don't care about people like that. Individual donors. Like 
exactly. Exactly. Yep, so exactly. It's just same zip code, and it's right. Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so yeah. So if you think about it, it's slavery, it's you know, the right to right vote, right to education. It's, right right it's right all, all yes. And who's the only population uh, who cares? Yeah. Exactly. It's the voter charge. And the issue of, it's like, the forced right. labor and incarceration, too. Yeah. Restrictive housing. Mm-hmm. Reentry. Yeah. She's spinning. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. as you were leaving out and you were talking about uh, cool. regional centers, uh, so, doing so you geared towards we were talking with, uh, Brad Jack church, down yeah. Jackson County, and about how it was safe for him to get people transferred over. Yeah. And I was like, what are we doing? He's like, if we could do it here, and then... Would make, like, make like, exactly like, 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 all everything. Yeah. Okay. Like, That's like, great. I was like, <laughs> was like, Jonathan was just talking about if we could do. This is good though. Like, even to, I need to watch. So it's just on YouTube. Yeah. Well, this one, that this kind of. You know what? The, the thing that always bothered me about the regional centers, they have like five housing units, and they're used for yeah. one of them sitting in. Okay. And we're, we could put the kids in a serious zone. And instead, Children Park Church a couple of years yeah. ago sent a kid down. He had never and he never saw that. Oh. Uh, so he was one kid because he couldn't be around adults. And it's like, we just decided mm -hmm. we're not going to be competitive with what it costs. Huh. Yeah. So it's like, it's like, okay. yeah. so yeah. we're just going to go. We don't have enough staff. So I talked to Senator Frederickson because he, you know, his background is in the mental health. Sure. Oh, okay. So that's what those kind of like, we need to look at how we're going to be competitive when it comes to hiring people. I said, with LB50 and the stuff they put in there now about people just bringing green skin, you know, being able to pay. Show it. Oh, that's always, that we've done some of those, and it's always been like, okay, you get the right, and you got, yeah, it's, yeah. And streaming, yeah, I guess YouTube, you're good, but yeah, streaming, how to. Right. So try to push that stuff, but then also, Senator Frederick saying, I told him about the antiquated medicine. Okay. Do the film. Okay. Okay. That's, you know, some districts you're looking for. Well, we've got two or three. Yeah. yeah. Really? So, you, I mean, not. <laughs> and you go. And this is what? Was it, this, you said, was in the last three weeks? I don't know. So, it's, it's building. Exactly. The inspection you know, like, That's why we don't know that. Are even just in the short term that they haven't had access, we're already seeing the effects of not knowing. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 just second. Yeah. And I was just talking with my policy intern. And then when we looked at it, you know, they were talking about how they didn't have to do that. Okay. Sometimes they can't even get on the same voting path. <laughs> and then we shoot ourselves in the foot. <laughs> no. And then trying to work across the aisle. And because we met with Hanson about the SNAP bill, and he's like, "Well, can we? You know, I, I didn't think nobody should go without food, but can we put like a um, a time limit? On, what kind of time limit?" <laughs> he's like, "Well, when they first get out in the six months, I said that would be great to get people SNAP for six months when they first get out, but you're trying to basically tell me after the six months that they're not eligible anymore for the rest of their life." I said, "I have people who are contacting us." who are now in their 50s and 60s who can't get SNAP and they are disabled or Yeah, whatever. they could be disabled. It has nothing to do with their felony conviction. Yeah. <laughs> people have changed their lives, but because they did it when they were They're in their 20s. They're just mean. Those people are just mean. Yeah. And you know what? It started out as a program to help farmers. Yeah. And now the farmer's like, screw those people. They're all <laughs> really, it's all... When Ron Reagan started talking about the welfare queen, and then they did the Willie Horton thing, yeah. it just became about race. Right. Yeah. We'll just <laughs> and so working with um, Drug Policy uh, org, they are um, they were asking us to like come and talk to vacant staff to 
see if he would sign on to the uh, farm bill to uh, do away with it federally. So they're work at the federal level to get rid of it. I was like, I mean, I guess I can come on the call. I don't know what's up, but uh, I guess a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, he signed on. So, like, all right, now is it going to go He's anyway? talking like a moderate on TV right now. Yeah. And he's getting <laughs> forward that are in purple districts and have them. Yeah. That's what I've seen when seeing Ricketts out in the <laughs> One of my uh, Justice Study members is like, oh, I'm going to go up to uh, Heartland Workforce Solutions. They have like Even just like a, yeah, like a 20, 30, yeah. Something is, yeah, yeah, I didn't even, and we were saying like, not out there as much because the inspector general doesn't have access, so we already do. Like just very, eh, like, just not that this can be some larger, yeah, it's just like, yeah. But when we do hire a policy yeah, we'll fellow, which should be within the next so few weeks, I might have them reach out to you and yeah, connect yeah, with you because yeah, because yeah. they're specifically going to focus on uh, criminal legal prisoners. Right? Like that's going to be their main focus, and so I'll get that person yeah, to yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And just yeah. Okay, that's good to know. I mean, we're trying because we're re intentionally recruiting some. We want someone who's had experiences within that system, so it's not just like a random person coming in being like, "Hey, here," you know. So So he said something. Okay. And, and he did this when he was inside. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, that's because we, there's so many different things that we file complaints and they don't do it. Yeah, so that's interesting well, to know. Yeah. There's, a lot, of, yeah. there's yeah. a lot of engagement yeah. in the article. Oh, I so what do we do with these? Uh, uh, the, uh, okay. Oh, okay. So that was him and they came. Yeah. Okay. 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 Cool. Yeah, thanks All right, yeah. No, no. <laughs> I think we did enough chiming. I think that was on like a movie one. Yeah, exactly. Maybe like police something. Okay, this is the rest of it. Still got the plan. Yeah.
also how we can better help, especially young students and children, um, to sort of stop some of that school to prison type thing and making sure that they're not being used.
I want to talk about the question about generational poverty. So I served uh, over 12 years. I served with Senator Chambers. I served with Brenda Council, and I served with Terrell McKinney. And I will say that Terrell McKinney, who I served with for, for my last two years, really brought to, like Senator Chambers has been on corrections and, and justice issues the entire 40 years he was down there. But Senator McKinney has come in with really a, how do we get to the bottom of that generational poverty? And you saw um, Senators uh, McKinney and Wayne work on getting some resources coming into North and South Omaha, which I think is intended, hopefully, uh, to help address some of those issues. But I can tell you, I was very impressed with uh, Senator McKinney and his commitment to trying to address sort of not just how are we going to stop people from going into prison, but what's the core problem in his opportunity? Uh, his district is 11 down in Northeast Omaha. He's doing a great job of bringing awareness to the legislature, and I think they've done a lot of work in that respect. Um, I will just hand the mic. I'm going to hand the mic off to these two. Because so many people said, how do I get involved? I think the ACLU and RISE are great resources if you want an avenue, because it's really hard to know everything you need to know to feel comfortable being becoming an advocate. Two great organizations, and maybe they, as they wrap things up, can talk a little bit about how you might get involved in RISE or get involved in the ACLU. Okay. Um, so I have um, pamphlets, reports, my business cards up here. Um, if you want to connect and, and dig in a little more on how you can support RISE, I can connect you with our volunteer manager. So our, if you go to seeusrise.org, that's our website, and we have a Get Involved tab. It has all of our volunteer opportunities. So we're starting to get people back in facilities. It's, if you want to go to one of our uh, events that uh, Senator Lathrop mentioned, we have a business coaching day and then a graduation. Um, and we bring people from the community, volunteers, in. That is an extensive background check by the um, NDCS. Um, so it's a lengthy process to get approved to go in. Uh, we do have uh, digital coaching opportunities. Uh, I think that one is up and running right now. We're from the comfort of your own home. So on our first half of our program, we look at resumes, business ideas, and uh, personal statements. How do people talk about themselves when they're going into an interview, when they're meeting with the landlord, things like that. So you can provide feedback on that, um, and it's guided. We have guides and all that. So it's an easy, low-level entry way to get involved as well. Um, you can sign up for my action alerts. I'll be doing uh, those blasts when the um, session starts in January. And we also have our community. Um, we have our business academy, which I did not mention. We have our youth and family programs uh, where we look for volunteers. Uh, for the business academy, these are people in the community who have been system impacted, who are ready to start their businesses. Um, so we have a 12-week program that walks people through this process, getting them the information they need. How do I create an LLC? What is marketing and branding? And they are paired with a business mentor. So if you own a business and have that experience, we're always looking for that. And um, our youth and family programs, we have wellness coffee hours for women who have been impacted. They're always looking for inspirational women to talk to them. Um, we have ways where you can donate for like art supplies, because each of those programs are for people in the community um, whose family have been impacted by incarceration. And they look at things that like healthy relationships, how to integrate your loved ones back into the family. And at the end of each section, they have like um, an art installation, if you will. So we, we do poems, we've done murals, um, mosaics, things like that. It's kind of like an art therapy, if you will. So there's just all kinds of different ways to get involved. So normally refer those out to organizations who have um, more extensive clauses, and then we can refer our people there because we um, are limited on the space that we have to try and keep everything. Okay. Yeah, and then from the ACLU perspective, um, of course, aclunebraska.org has um, a lot of up-to-date information. We also have 
and Instagram and Facebook. And then again, I would plug that QR code Smart Justice Advocate um, portion of the handout because um, there you can not only select certain issues within what we call Smart Justice that you want to get involved in, but then you can also select um, the types of things you would, you would be um, interested in doing. So whether that be testifying at a legislative hearing when those bills come up or um, hosting a house party and we would provide you a kit of materials and swag to kind of spread the word and share this information or just a couple of the um, things within that smart justice advocate um, um, portion of our work. And so I would encourage everyone to do that and then that just will get you the most up-to-date information. So thank you everyone. Thank you. 